The cycles of our planet can seem too great for us to fully imagine. The idea of a million years boggles most minds. Even a hundred thousand years can seem vague. But there is another cycle that rules the seas and takes place at a far more human pace, twice a day to be exact. The rise and fall of the tides is such an integral part of our lives that we even record and include them in our daily weather reports. But what actually causes this ebb and flow? The answer is floating in the sky above us. The moon is a lifeless ball of barren rock and dust. But by some strange twist, it has allowed life on Earth to flourish. Not only does it keep our planet steady on its rather wobbly axis, but it also governs the tides, the twice-daily inhalations and exhalations that endlessly renew life on the shoreline. But how does the moon govern our tides? The easy answer, of course, is gravity. Or more precisely, the moon's gravitational force on the Earth. Now, let's for a moment pretend that the balloon is the Earth and this is the moon. And what happens is, as the moon orbits around the Earth, exerting its magnetic force on the planet, it draws all the water in our oceans towards itself. Now, this sounds simple enough, but there's a catch, because when it's high tide over here, and all the water's been pulled toward the moon, it should follow that the other side should be low tide. However, when it's high tide here, it's also high tide over here. If I swirl this balloon around, the water inside it and centrifugal force causes it to bulge. This is an extreme version of what happens to the ocean on the opposite side of the Earth to the moon. As we spin through space, centrifugal force pulls the ocean outwards, which is why we have high tides on both sides of the planet simultaneously. This side pulled out by the force of the moon, this side pushed out by centrifugal force as we whirl through space. The tides have been instrumental in allowing life to flourish on our planet. And this is never more true than in a unique habitat ruled entirely by the ebb and flow of salt water and fresh. Estuaries are a place of transition where the physical, biological and chemical properties of the marine world are transformed into the world of the fresh water and vice versa, creating a habitat that's found nowhere else on Earth. Estuaries are unique but fragile environments. They're amazingly productive and they support vast amounts of life, from tiny microscopic shrimp to large numbers of wading birds. But estuaries are also important for fish, and not just those species of fish that are specific to the estuary, but large numbers of our marine species that depend on estuaries as a vital link in their life cycle, using them as nursery areas for the juveniles. Estuaries are fed by nutrients coming down rivers and in from the sea. But what do we mean when we talk about nutrients? And where does all this edible, digestible stuff come from? If you've ever spent any time on the West Coast, you'll probably have noticed two things. One, the water is extremely cold. And two, that the plants seem to love it here. And you might wonder, well, why do the plants grow so thick here? Why do we get these big forests of kelp here and not on the east coast where it's warmer and you'd expect them to grow? The answer, of course, is that the water is saturated with nutrients. So what I'm driving the boat through right now, it's essentially a rather chilly stew of plant food. The reason that the water here is so full of nutrients is actually the same reason that it's so cold. You see, here on the west coast, the prevailing winds are southeasterly, and that means that they actually blow so hard they push the surface water away from the coast. That water has to be replaced, 
And what it's replaced by is water from down in the dark depths, where there are millennia's worth of decaying organisms. So basically, it's like water coming straight from a compost heap. It's dark, it's cold, and it's nutrient rich. Rich enough, in fact, to allow a few species to flourish in huge numbers. 50% of all life on Earth is found in the oceans. And that's just the life that we know about because the oceans are still largely unexplored. But what we do know is that the South African shoreline has some of the most varied and abundant life in the world. We owe that incredible richness and diversity to our two great currents, which have created not one, but two dramatically different marine worlds in one relatively small country. To the west, the cold Benguela creeps sluggishly north along the barren Namaqualand shore, bringing with it the icy waters of the South Atlantic. To the east, the picture changes dramatically. This is a coast fed by the warm Agulhas Current, squeezed between Africa and Madagascar and funneling warm water down from the tropics. And the results are spectacular. A dazzling kaleidoscope of colors reveals that this is a kinder ocean than in the west. Back on the west coast, I'm about to explore a living symbol of its abundance, a golden underwater forest of kelp. Just as forests on land offer food and shelter to woodland or rainforest birds and animals, so kelp provides a habitat for dozens of marine species. more importantly, its strong but flexible stalks and leaves act as a buffer against the pounding waves, diffusing the sea's destructive energy and allowing more delicate species to thrive inside its protective barrier. It's one thing to look at a map and see a blue arrow going up the west coast showing the Benguela current and a red arrow coming down the east coast showing the Agulhas current. But it's another thing altogether, experiencing it underwater for yourself. The nutrient soup off the west coast is a blessing, but every so often it can also be malevolent. The Benguela current is a very productive marine ecosystem. Coastal upwelling brings massive amounts of nutrients into the water. Combined with sunlight, the microalgae found in the water can sometimes multiply on a grand scale, depleting the water of oxygen and depriving other marine creatures that depend on the vital gas. In a phenomenon we refer to as a red tide, the result of which we see here today. Starved of oxygen, marine species are in effect suffocated in their watery home. Fish have nowhere to go, but for species with legs, there is one desperate option left, walking up onto the beach in a phenomenon known as a walkout. And this one at Elans Bay on the west coast was enormous. Entire populations of lobster driven into the eager beaks of seagulls by the deadly tide. At this walkout, police and army were on hand to prevent a health disaster from unfolding. But they also acted as conservationists. So these good folks here from the Department of Fisheries are doing the best that they can, trying to save as many of these poor rock lobster as possible, moving them further down, down the coast to where the red tide is less severe and where they stand a better chance of survival. It's really quite tragic. On the third day of this walkout, 2,000 kilograms of lobster were rescued and put into holding tanks at Elans Bay. More than half were mature, which meant that the relatively slow growth cycle of these populations won't be too badly interrupted. A 
of course, the sad reality is that as, as much as they're trying to save as many of these of this lobster, not all of them are going to make it. For example, the shy shark, it's still breathing at the moment, but uh, it's not going to survive. So, uh, again, it's very tragic. Red tides are a natural phenomenon, but the carnage they bring can still appear shocking to us. Well, you guys still have a long way to go to get to this. And thanks to today's operation, they might well stand a chance. So, into the crate they go. We rarely see the ocean culling her own on so grand a scale. Still, one wonders whether human intervention in a natural phenomenon such as this is an entirely bad thing.